No tour of the Grand Circle is complete without spending at least a couple of days in the area around Moab, Utah. This is an outdoor lover's paradise. The world's largest selection of natural stone arches is just a few miles up the road in Arches National Park. A little further up the road are the amazing views of the Island in the Sky District of Canyonlands National Park. But there's more. There's an incredible overlook in Dead Horse Point State Park. There are lazy float trips and multi-day white water trips on the Colorado River. And for those who like heights, there are 500-foot cliffs and the Fisher Towers just waiting to be climbed. Sure, you can drive through the parks, but there are other ways to see the amazing scenery. There are short and long trails for hikers and cyclists. And there are rough high clearance and 4x4-only trails to explore the backcountry. And if you want to exercise your brain, or perhaps your child's brain, there are incredible lessons in geologic and human history. The town of Moab itself is quite a little gem. It seems a lot bigger than other towns of 5,100 people. Whether you're a budget camper, or if you prefer accommodations that are as special as the scenery, you can find it all in Moab. There are restaurants of all types, and even a few night spots. If you didn't bring your 4x4, mountain bike, or other gear, you can rent them all here. Sorry about the sound break. I wrote that intro a few years ago. It's valid up to there, but because so many people are going to Moab's parks these days, the parks have had to make some changes to combat overcrowding. This area is one of the most scenic in the country, and it's one of my favorite places. Arches National Park is the main draw, but to visit it now, during the busy season, you need a special timed entry ticket just to get past the gate. I'll tell you how to get one of those in a few minutes, but first, let me show you why so many people want to go to Arches. This is a segment from my Mighty Five Parks Grand Tour. No Grand Circle Tour is complete without spending at least a day in Arches National Park. It's a delightfully colorful place where 100 million years of erosion create ever-changing natural sculptures and architecture. The park is small enough to drive through in a few hours, but it's intriguing enough that some spend a week or two exploring it on foot, on bicycles, and on off-road vehicles in search of adventure in the land of more than 2,000 arches. Because of our limited time, we'll explain how to make the most out of about a day and a half in the park. The entrance is just four miles from the center of town. After paying the National Park entry fee, it's a good idea to stop at the visitor center to learn about the area you're about to explore. The bulk of the park is on a plateau, several hundred feet above the visitor center. The road switches back twice as it climbs the Moab Fault. A sign near the top states that six million years ago, the rock layers on this side of the valley drop 2,600 feet lower than those on the other side of the valley. Once on the plateau, the park road winds its way north past four to 500 foot sandstone monoliths that were pushed up through the surrounding landscape. The first large pullout is for a place called Park Avenue. The high stone walls reminded early explorers of the famous New York landmark. It's hard to understand just how big everything is until you see someone wandering in the rocks. There is a short trail, but summer temperatures are often in the 90s or higher, so you need to bring plenty of water. From the viewpoint, you get your first look at the different rock in the park. The arches tend to form in the Entrada sandstone. Here it's way up near the top. Throughout the park, you'll see signs stating, don't bust the crust. It's alive. This refers to microorganisms that live in the soil. It takes a hundred years for tiny black bacteria to create enough soil for even the most basic plants. And one step from your boot could kill it. So don't bust the crust. A little further down the road, we come to the LaSalle Mountain viewpoint. Beyond the outcrop are petrified yellowish sand dunes. In the background, to the east, the LaSalles rise 13,000 feet, so snow covers them most of the time. To the north, there's a great view of several more features. These are the three gossips. This is the organ and the Tower of Babel. While we drive to our next stop, I'll try to explain how the landscape got this way. It all started about 300 million years ago, 
when this tectonic plate was closer to the equator. This land was covered by seawater, so much seawater that 7,900 feet of mostly salt, but also potash and gypsum, accumulated before the sea dried up. For much of the next 100 to 150 million years, hundreds of feet of sand and other soft materials built up on top of the salt, during a time when this region was dry and much like today's Sahara Desert. By this time, the ancestral Rocky Mountains were eroding away, providing plenty of overburdened material which helped turn the ancient desert sand to stone. The weight of the sand and the mountain debris put pressure on the underlying salt layer. Under pressure, salt becomes a semi-fluid. It moves and oozes, kind of like pushing on the center of a tube of toothpaste. Because the weight of the sand and other overburden varied from place to place, in some places the ground sank, and in others it pushed up massive slabs of sandstone, like the one seen here. Starting 100 million years ago, the erosion process began to take over and the tectonic plate began moving north. All this movement caused many vertical cracks that created giant blocks of sandstone, as well as thinner stone slabs. This can be seen quite easily from the air in the Devil's Garden. Over time, the cracks became wider, and with the help of the erosional forces of water, ice, and wind, the tall slabs began to look like the fins we see in the park today. In many places, erosional forces and waterborne chemical reactions further weaken the stone, causing holes to form in the fins. When a hole has a span of at least three feet, it's classified as an arch. This process has occurred at least 2,000 times in the park, and it continues to happen. And from time to time, arches do collapse. That's the end of the lecture, and just in time. We've reached our next stop. This was the original entrance to the park. It's called Balanced Rock. It's 128 feet tall. There used to be a smaller balanced rock nearby, but it fell over in the 70s. One day, this one will fall over too. A bit further down the road is a turnoff for the window section. Once again, the view out the windscreen is quite good. The road generally goes southeast at this point, so the best light is in the afternoon. With the windows and double arch, this is a very popular area and it can be difficult to find a parking spot most of the day. After a short walk from the parking lot, there's a fork in the trail. To the right is Turret Arch. To the left is the windows. The north window is pretty impressive in the evening, but in the morning, if you climb through it, you'll see one of the park's iconic views. That's Turret Arch as seen through the north window just after sunrise. To get to this spot, well, it requires a bit of a scramble. It's not easy or even very safe. In fact, the man in this shot decided it was too dangerous for him to try to get to this camera position. Once here and after your nerves have settled, you get to appreciate just how big and incredible these formations are. Across the parking lot is another well-known feature, Double Arch. You may recognize it from a scene in the Indiana Jones movies. With a little effort, you can climb right into it. A further two and a half miles up the road is a spur road to the most famous arch in the park, Delicate Arch. Again, it can be difficult to find a place to park. Sorry, yes, it's time for another break, but I really wanted to emphasize the parking problem. As you can see, there aren't many spaces available. And at sunset, it's almost impossible to get one. But when the lot is full, there is another way to see the famous arch. A mile down the road, there's even a smaller parking area for the lower Delicate Arch viewpoint. There's a viewing area just near the parking lot, and there's another up a short trail. As you'll see, I've been to both. The Delicate Arch Trail is a three-mile round trip. They climb steadily up 480 feet. It starts near an original homesteader's cabin. Then there's a spur trail to a wall of Ute Indian petroglyphs. From there, the trail winds its way over what they call slick rock, which is a sandstone that is anything but slick. Maybe if it's wet. The trail can disappear on the rock, just follow the main route. Near the top, the trail follows a narrow shelf. And when you turn the corner, there's the great view. A small cabin near the trailhead was built by the Wolf family 
who settled here in the late 1800s. They managed to eke out a living here for more than 20 years. Delicate Arch is a mile and a half and almost 500 feet up the mostly slick rock trail, which by the way isn't slippery. It's more like sandpaper. This is the most recognized view in Utah. It's even on the state license plate. The 63 foot tall arch is at the edge of a large sandstone bowl that has been hollowed out by swirling wind and water. Again, the LaSalle Mountains provide the backdrop. At sunset, this is the perfect place to be. If the main Delicate Arch parking lot is full, there's another way to see the famous arch. Head a mile or so down the road to the lower Delicate Arch trailhead. This trail is less traveled, and you can't get very close to it from here. But it's still amazingly odd to see a large stone arch perched in a bowl on the edge of a sheer cliff. The road next leads to the Fiery Furnace. Here you can take a ranger-led hike, but you have to purchase your tickets in advance to guarantee a spot. Unfortunately, the only video we have of it is from 1995. Hi, I'm Rob Lorenz at Arches National Park. Arches is known for its vibrant color, whimsical well, shapes, and vast desert anymore. landscape. I in haven't been lucky enough to win the lottery to get sky, on the trail again, but the, fiery furnace but the takes park service has made a video that helps show off the trail, the trail park. and also prepare it's you long, for it if you're lucky enough of to get some tickets. Canyons and, fins and this create a is maze that of video. rock that when seen from above makes it seem like the landscape's been scraped with a giant rake. Here at ground level, this wonderland of rock beckons visitors seeking shade, solitude, and adventure. Because the fiery furnace harbors rare plants and fragile soils in a confined area, the National Park Service limits the number of people that can enter it each day. In order to visit the fiery furnace, you must obtain a permit at the visitor center or join a ranger on a guided walk. However, a guided walk through the fiery furnace isn't for everyone. The tour route is roughly two miles long and takes about three hours to complete, so a moderate level of physical fitness is needed. Along the way, you'll encounter a few body-scraping passageways, exposure to steep drop-offs, lots of rock scrambling and tricky sections that require using your hands, feet, and even your rear end to maneuver. While injuries are rare, some areas may make people with a fear of heights or narrow spaces uncomfortable. Due to the difficulty and length of the tour, children under five years of age are not permitted. Believe it or not, there are absolutely no water fountains, snack machines, or bathrooms in the fiery furnace. So you'll have to make do with whatever you can carry from the trailhead. Speaking of which, you should plan on bringing at least one quart or liter of water, a snack, some sun protection, and an extra layer of clothes. Scared yet? You shouldn't be. You'll forget all these minor inconveniences once you're winding your way through this improbable landscape of fins, spires, and hidden arches. Fiery Furnace tours are offered daily from March through October, and tickets are usually purchased online. Now these walks often fill up a couple months in advance, so it's best to plan early to reserve your spot. On behalf of the National Park Service, we hope you join us soon in the Fiery Furnace. We're now on our way to the Devil's Garden. On the way, you may want to stop at Skyline Arch. It's one of the biggest in the park. As you might expect, it's also hard to find a parking spot in the Devil's Garden. If you find a spot, take the easy hike to the largest natural rock span in the world. Okay, now back to my The trail video. is sandy, and on hot days the trip can be tiring. So it's always a good idea to bring plenty of water. Soon, there's a view of fins in the distance. About a mile in, the trail forks to the left, and you can see the largest natural rock span in the world, Landscape Arch. In the afternoon, it's in shadow, but in the morning, it's lit. From base to base, it's 306 feet across, and no, you're not allowed to walk across it. Many years ago, a man died trying. Beyond Landscape Arch, there are many more arches along the trail. 
At about the three mile point, you get the chance to walk on top of a fin. It's a pretty unique experience. If you plan your trip very well, you can do all of the things described in this segment in a day to a day and a half. Although weather and crowds may force you to improvise. But no matter what you do, I'll bet that arches will be one of the highlights of your Grand Circle trip. For those of you interested in photography, here's a review of my favorite photo ops in the park. In addition to a good camera and tripod, you should also have an app on your phone that tells you where the sun will be at any time, anywhere. I use Helios for the iPhone. You should scout your locations on the phone before you start your trip. Around noon, most of the wall is in the sun. And in late afternoon, the good light will be hitting the largest wall. And that's when this shot was taken. At Balanced Rock, there are times in the morning when it can be backlit, so it's safer to shoot in the afternoon. The snowpack LaSalle Mountains will also be lit in the afternoon. As we said, it's best to shoot the back side of the north window just after sunrise but the side facing the parking lot looks great in the afternoon. Often tour groups of up to 20 people are here well before sunrise, leaving no room for many who want to get to this spot. This shot was taken near the windows. All I did was turn around and point the lens towards Double Arch. The main park road looks great in the late morning to early evening when heading north into the park. Going in the other direction, it's backlit in the evening. The best light is also on the fiery furnace in the afternoon and evening. To capture landscape arch in the sun, you'll have to hike a mile or so in the morning. In the afternoon it's backlit and it's even hard to see the arch. The best time to shoot delicate arch is at sunset. If the weather's nice, there will be a crowd. But there are plenty of good places to put your tripod. But still, it's best to be early. Again, remember to scout the location using a map or preferably a tool like Helios on the iPhone. It will tell you when and where the sun will rise and set. It'll really help you get a nice shot. Well, I hope that gives you an idea of why you need a reservation ticket just to get into Arches. It really is an amazing place. But you do need one of these tickets to get into the park. And the Park Service has made a video to tell you how to do it. Hi there. If you're planning to visit Arches between April 1st and October 31st, you'll need to purchase a time entry ticket to enter the park between the hours of 7 a.m. and 4 p.m. Tickets will be released on the first of the month, three months in advance. In order to visit, follow these two steps. Secure time to entry tickets in advance. Time to entry tickets will only be available online or over the phone from recreation.gov. Purchase your park pass or pay the entrance fee when you arrive. We encourage you to plan ahead and be prepared well before your visit. If you didn't get a reservation in advance, a limited number of next day tickets will be released at 6 p.m. Mountain Time daily. Just remember, you can only get these over the phone or on recreation.gov. Tickets will not be available at the entrance station didn't get a ticket at all, you can still enter the park before 7 a.m. and after 4 p.m. daily. Time entry tickets help evenly pace visitation into the park to lessen congestion and improve visitor experiences. For more information, including step-by-step -step instructions, a full ticket release schedule, and frequently asked questions, visit go.nps.gov forward slash arches ticket. See you soon. And by the way, I tried this myself. It was in early May, and I was able to get a ticket for the following week. It was 2 or 3 in the afternoon, but I was able to get a ticket. Of course, there's more than one park in the Moab area. Canyonlands National Park is just 30 miles away, on top of a nearly 2,000-foot mesa. And if you and your vehicle are up to it, there's a really fun way to get back to town. Canyonlands is an immense wilderness of cliffs, mesas, and of course canyons. It was shaped by the Colorado and Green Rivers into three separate districts. They are all primitive with no potable water. The districts are widely separated by fascinating and monumental natural features. 
and there are no roads linking them together. The Needles District Visitor Center is about 80 miles south-ish of Moab. Hiking trails are the main attraction here. It's a great place to hike in the middle of nowhere, while being somewhere incredible. The Mays District is on the west side, and it's even more remote. It's over 130 miles from Moab. The roads in this district are 4x4 four four only rough tracks, and they require a great deal of self-reliance and skill. The rivers in the park are categorized as a separate water district. You can easily spend a couple of weeks exploring each district, but we're going to spend our time in the most popular, the Island in the Sky. The Island in the Sky is, of course, a mesa. It's only 30 miles or 35 minutes from Moab. The road rises about 1,800 feet to an elevation of about 6,000 feet. And it isn't quite an island. A narrow 42-foot strip connects it to the main mesa. This sliver of a connection is called a neck. The road is so well designed that you won't have a clue that you're only a few feet away from a very long drop. Sheer cliffs at the edge of the mesa provide spectacular views at several viewpoints. This is the Green River Overlook. About 1,200 feet below, there's a broad shelf, technically called a bench. It's made of a much harder sandstone compared to the formations that, well, eroded away. Near the cliff edge, the rock looks almost like a beach. And millions of years ago, it was. And millions of years ago, this was part of an inland sea. Since then, the inland sea that divided the continent disappeared as tectonic forces pushed up a plate, creating a flat plain. More recently, the Colorado Plateau began to rise, allowing the rivers to shape the land in quite interesting ways. It's a harsh place, and it's not surprising that it was one of the last places in the continental U.S. to be explored and mapped. At the end of the Island Mesa, the viewpoint is appropriately called Grand View. On a clear day, you can see almost 100 miles in almost any direction. That thin line is a 100 plus mile 4x4 only path called the White Rim Road. Some of the surface scars are old mining roads cut during the 1940s and 50s to aid the search of uranium. We're looking south. In a few miles from here, the two fairly calm rivers combine into a fast moving Colorado River. You can hike to the confluence from the Needles District. A few miles south of the confluence, there's a 14 mile long section called Cataract Canyon. It's remote enough that only multi-day rafting trips can go through its Class 5 rapids. In 1869, John Wesley Powell and his team were the first white men to go down the river, and they did it in wooden boats. Near the Grand View Overlook is the Orange Cliffs Overlook, providing a great view to the west. Off in the distance, you're looking at the Maze District. This is a great spot to watch the sunset. Another great spot to catch sunset is Holman Spring Overlook. It's on the road to the Upheaval Dome. It faces southwest. When the clouds cooperate, it's almost magical. If you've been paying attention, you know that uplift has played a prominent role in shaping this park. There's one place in the park where this process is quite visible. A one-mile round-trip trail leads to the Upheaval Dome. In the rest of the park, there is geologic order. Old rocks are on the bottom, and newer ones are on top. There is little folding of the rock layers indicating that for millions of years, the region has been pretty stable. The upheaval dome is quite different. It's about three miles across, and it's a place of dramatic disorder. In the center, the rocks are tilted almost vertically. It's being forced up and therefore bending the formations above it. The formations we see shouldn't be here. They belong several thousand feet below. Some process push them up here. And from above, the dome looks like an impact crater from a meteorite. Some geologists think that roughly 60 million years ago, a meteor with a diameter of approximately one-third of a mile hit this spot. Even in this scientific age, nobody knows which theory is correct. Canyonlands is known for its spectacular, immense views of distant landscapes. But with the signature view in Island of the Sky, there's a twist. 
This is Mesa Arch. It's just a quarter mile from the main road. On a cloudy afternoon, it may not look that special. But at sunrise, it's stunning. Hundreds of people often gather around this spot well before sunrise. And they're all trying to squeeze into the same little spot. So there's lots of spillover. Most are here with the goal of getting a shot like this. Or this. Or if you have sharp elbows, you may even get a shot like this. The odd crowd is very international. It's sad that few Americans take the time to see this wonderful place. An hour or so after sunrise, the crowds are gone. And this becomes one of the rare places with the sound of silence. You can hear yourself blink here. The views of Canyonlands are evocative. They draw you into the landscape. And there's a place where you can do just that. This is the Schaefer Trail viewpoint. 100 years ago, the Schaefer brothers used the canyon walls as a natural corral. They built the first trail up this 1,200-foot cliff to get their cattle to market. Today, it's a popular SUV trail, and we're about to take it all the way down to the Colorado River and back to Moab. Moab, Utah is an outdoor lover's paradise. It's the home of Arches National Park and Canyonlands National Park, where there's river rafting, rock climbing, hiking, and mountain biking. When you need an easy day, there's great photography, history, and even nice restaurants and some nightlife. You can even have an off-road adventure in your own car. This is the Schaefer Trail, as seen from the neck in the Island of the Sky District of Canyonlands. The first drop descends about 1,100 feet in a series of switchbacks. And believe it or not, you can safely drive it in your own SUV. And that's just what we're about to do. To get there, take Highway 313 towards the Canyonland entrance. The trailhead is a couple of miles before the Island in the Sky Visitor Center. When the pavement ends, the road is still flat, as if to give you more time to get used to driving on the loose, sandy surface. Then there's an impressive overlook just before the trail cuts into the cliff face. We recorded nearly the entire one and a half hour drive. And in order to show you as much of it as possible, I've sped up most of the driving footage. I did the trail a few years ago, and this time I didn't stop as often. I know it can look scary, but the road is surprisingly wide. It's even safe to pass. The first time I remember being, well, not really scared, let's call it intimidated. The drop-off off the driver's window is about 1,100 feet, and it's very steep. But this time, before starting out, I did what is recommended. I checked on the trail's condition with the ranger at the visitor center. I learned that because the trail is so popular, the top portion is graded more often than it was in the past. The ranger actually said that the steep switchback section was the easiest part of the trip. I also grabbed a map. The dirt trail is 17 miles long. About halfway through, it changes names to the Potash Road. At the river, the trail joins the paved Highway 279 for several miles back to Moab. From the trailhead at 5,920 feet above sea level, we'll drop about 1,900 feet before getting back to Moab. The trail drops gradually, and the special low-range descend gear of the SUV did enough to help me avoid overheating the brakes. On my first trip, I warped the front rotors. Most of the ride is uneventful. You can hardly tell that you're descending until you get to a switchback. By the way, if you don't want to put wear and tear on your own vehicle, you can rent a 4x4 Jeep in Moab. This was originally a cattle trail. Local ranchers called the Schaefer Brothers built it about 100 years ago to get their cattle to market. It was expanded greatly in the 1940s when it was used by uranium prospectors. That's also when many of the roads on the canyon floor were cut. Many of these still scar the landscape. By the 50s, the Schaefer Trail was nearly forgotten. Like the rest of the area, it became a part of the National Park in 1964. The trail became popular only recently. In 1980, only 57,000 people visited all of Canyonlands. Today, nearly a million come every year. 
Though the view is amazing, the drive is remarkably normal. There's never an uh-oh moment, or even a slight slip of the wheels. After about 10 minutes, the initial ascent is about over. It was almost too quick, though I never got over 15 miles an hour. Here's what I said about it at the time. Well, that was it. That was pretty easy. We dropped 11 to 1,200 feet uh, in about 15 minutes at the most, it looks like. Didn't get a chance to look at the view. Basically, I'm looking at the road about 15 to 20 feet in front of me. It's pretty darn interesting, let me tell you. Thoroughly enjoying it. Mountain bikers from around the world come to Moab, and some even try to pedal up this road. As a cyclist myself, I ask if the rider needs food or water. It's over 90 degrees, and sometimes they just might need it. There are several connecting trails in the canyon. The longest is the White Rim Road. It's over 100 miles long, winding its way across the cap rock, often just a few feet from the canyons that are cut by the Colorado and Green Rivers, which are hundreds of feet below. The White Rim Road can be seen from many of Canyonland's viewpoints. Here it is from the Green River Overlook. There are few signs on the trail, but they do helpfully exist at this T intersection. The road ahead is the White Rim. The Schaefer Trail goes to the left. The ranger I talked to said the White Rim Trail was safe for two-wheel drive vehicles like mine, up to Muscle Man Arch, whatever that is. He says you'll know it when you see it. Well, I decided to go exploring. Oddly, the White Rim rises slightly. This took a toll on a couple of cyclists. These were a part of a tour group with a support vehicle. Because I hadn't studied this part of the map, I was expecting the trail to be near the rim. It wasn't, and it became sandier. This is not a place to get stuck. The trail info sheet states that it's best to take enough food and water for a day or two in case you break down and have to be rescued. It also claims that towing charges could easily reach $1,000. At a wide spot in the road, next to the cyclist support vehicle, I decided to head back. I learned later that Muscle Man Arch was a further 40 minutes down the road. A mile or so later, I rejoined the Schaefer Trail. A wooden sign claims that it's 32 miles to Moab via the Potash Road. I've traveled about eight miles so far, so the trail map, well, it's a bit misleading. A few hundred yards later, it starts to get rough. The path narrows and gets very rough as you descend into Schaefer Canyon. It's here that you realize why you need a high clearance vehicle. Going slow and dodging the largest of the sharp rocks is critical. It becomes evident that the ranger was right. The top section is the easy part. Then there's a fairly flat clearing with nice views. This is a great spot to take your time or even stop to enjoy the scenery. It gets rough again as you cross a wash. During a rain, this part can be treacherous or even impassable. To drive up is also a challenge. These motorcyclists asked me about the part I just drove down, and they shared what was next for me. The trail is now on a broad shelf above the Colorado River. The cliffs rise 12 to 1,500 feet, and the view is amazing. It took 45 minutes to get here, including the White Rim excursion. From Dead Horse Point, high above, you can see this part of the road. This is the only overlook on the river, so it's worth spending some time exploring it and taking it all in. When Buzz Aldrin stepped on the moon, he described what he saw as magnificent desolation. I can think of no better way to describe this spot. It makes the rough ride well worth the effort. In the other direction, in the layers, you see millions of years of geology and earth history. A little farther down the road, a faded spur trail heads to the right and provides another view of the river. Unfortunately, I didn't know this until I saw the spur trail from Dead Horse Point State Park the next day. Now that you know it's here, you should take it.
From Dead Horse Point, you can see the next few miles of the road, and a few more spur trails. By this time, the trail has changed names. It's now called the Potash Road, and a portion of the White Rim Road. The road meanders for several miles. By the way, we're no longer in Canyonlands National Park. In fact, we haven't been since just before the River Overlook. On some maps, the road even has a number. It's called County Road 142. When the landscape opens up, again, you get that feeling of magnificent desolation. It's another good spot to stop and take a few pictures. As you go over a crest, there's a brief hint of blue on the horizon. They are potash evaporation pools from a mining operation. They provide a few of the non-tourism related jobs in Moab. They also provide nice contrast to the landscape. The road ends down at river level, so there are still several hundred feet to drop. And drop it does. It was too rough for the stabilization system, so sorry for the bumps. There are other trails down here, and there are no signs, so it's easy to get a bit lost especially when heading in the other direction. Telephone poles are a sign that it's almost over. There are only a few miles of dirt road left. There's one more interesting photo up just before leaving the dirt. This balanced rock is about the size of a small bungalow. When you hit the pavement, you're on Highway 279. It starts just after the boat dock on the Colorado River. Suddenly, there's more greenery along the road. The Colorado is just to the right. Then there are great sandstone cliffs. This area is called Wall Street. Look for a sign pointing to Indian writing. Several feet above the road, in the dark desert varnish, the ancients left their mark. Most depict animals and those who hunted them. You may be wondering why they're so high off the ground. Well, the natural level of the dirt was below the area of the desert varnish. The dirt was removed when they built Highway 279. A little further down the road is the rock climbing area. This is the easy section, where local outfitters train first timers to climb these nearly vertical walls. It seems fitting to end a journey that began by descending a cliff by watching someone climb one. There are just a few more miles back to Moab, and this will give you plenty of time to reflect. In just a couple of hours, you've descended over 1,900 feet on a road that was carved into a cliff. You've spent time in a harsh, pristine, former ranch with 1,200 foot tall stone walls that were once used as a natural corral. You've seen how resources are mined. You've seen ancient writing. And you've seen how some cheat gravity. All in all, not a bad way to spend an hour and a half to three hours. Most Moab visitors just go to the national parks. But those who really know the area also go to Dead Horse Point State Park, and they take a drive up scenic Route 128, at least as far as the Fisher Towers. To get to Dead Horse Point, head towards Canyonlands. They share Highway 313, take the first left, and continue until the road ends. Dead Horse Point State Park is at the end of a several mile long butte that juts into and above Canyonlands. It has the only campground in the area with running water, and at the end of the road is one of my favorite viewpoints, not just of Canyonlands, but of anywhere. The lookout is almost 2,000 feet above the Green River. The island in the sky and Mesa Arch are just to the southwest, near the horizon. The dirt road below is the Schaefer Trail. It starts in the island in the sky, the gravel continues on for 17 miles until it reaches the Colorado River. To the east, there's a view of snow-capped mountains. 
Also to the east, you see the colorful evaporation ponds from a potash mining business. On a clear, still morning, Dead Horse Point is another place with the sounds of silence. On a clear day, the view stretches out nearly 100 miles in almost any direction. Because of the harsh climate and rugged landscape, it should be no surprise that this was one of the last places in the continental U.S. to be explored and mapped. This is a favorite place for photographers, and many get there pretty early. One group told me they got here at about 4 a.m. to capture the Milky Way galaxy as it rose to the southwest. But the best light to shoot the canyons is a little after sunrise. Photo tour leaders know this, and there are often crowds of shutterbugs clinging to the cliffs. In the afternoon, the light isn't quite as dramatic. But Dead Horse Point is always a great place to be. Back in the olden days, the folks used to take us on long, scenic drives, just for the fun of it. A few miles north, there's a great road to carry on that tradition. It's called Highway 128. National Geographic called it spectacular. The road S's its way along the river and through a canyon for almost 26 miles. A Moab bike trail continues between the road and the river. The closest commercial airport to Moab is in Grand Junction, Colorado. This is the scenic way to get there. The canyon gets wider past Red Cliffs Lodge and Resort. This is a great place to float or paddle down the river. Many of the flat areas near the river are used for farming, with help of irrigation from the river. We're now in the Castle Valley, and Hollywood loves these roads. One of them leads to another called the Professor Valley, which was used in City Slickers 2, Austin Powers, and many other Hollywood movies. Near mile marker 21, there's a small sign pointing east to the Fisher Towers. They were named after an 1880s pioneer. This is a BLM recreation area with a small campground and a pit toilet, but no water. There are a number of hiking trails, but since the 1960s, the main activity here is rock climbing. There are small spires to learn on, and there are much bigger ones for the highly skilled. A further 11 miles up Highway 128, there's another old landmark. Pull over just before crossing the bridge. Believe it or not, this relic was once the longest suspension bridge in Utah, and it held that title until April of 2008, when it was destroyed by a grass fire, started by a small boy who was playing with matches. It was called the Dooley Bridge when it was built in 1916. It had a 500 foot long wooden driving surface that was only eight feet wide. More recently, it was used as a bike trail. This scenic highway continues for another 20 miles. It's a great way to spend an evening. So when in Moab, there's more to do than just explore the national parks. Yes, they are fantastic, but Dead Horse Point, Highway 128, as well as mountain biking and other activities I'll allow you to discover, are also worth exploring. If this video helps you, please click the like button and subscribe. It's the easiest way to help the channel. And for those of you who are so inclined, donations are also welcome. They come in especially handy since the Park Service now requires YouTubers to have a filming permit in order to film and post video on social media. Some of these permits can cost up to $350 per park. Seems outrageous, but it's true. So thanks again. And please, click that like button.